like 19, but like I'm lost. I don't know what I'm doing because I want to escape the matrix basically. Right. They, they hear this term from like yeah. Andrew Tate and they're like, yeah, I want to escape the matrix. And they like get to that point where they quote unquote can escape the matrix. They don't need to go to college. They don't need a job. As long as they keep their head on straight and they don't blow the money they're making, they'll be able to make enough sustainably for a long time. But they don't know what they're doing. They don't know why they're doing it. They don't have a plan for the business and therefore they don't know where it can possibly go. Uh, right. So, so I always tell them, Hey, like, do you have a number that's going to make you happy? You know, or do you, do you need 10,000 a month to be happy? Do you need a hundred thousand a month personally take home after tax? Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. This is episode number 206 with Caitlin Marola, the founder and CEO of Move Marketing, a five-year-old marketing agency based in California that focuses on startups. I wanted to talk with Caitlin because she runs her company through the lens of transparency, something that is very difficult with startups. In this conversation, we talked about how she finds clients, how she works with clients, how she thinks of the future of her business, how she's changing herself right now as the company is growing, and much more. So if you like the founder's journey and teach me something, then this is going to be a great episode for you. Let's get to it. I would say by far the most difficult client to work with is that of a startup founder. Why do you want to serve them? What is it about startups that makes you feel like it's worth it every day? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I love serving startups. I come from startups. My early career was in B2B tech startups. Um, so it's something I know. It's something I've been in before. Um, I like the fast paced, hyper growth nature of a startup that's doing well. Um, I like how decisions get made at a startup. Um, sometimes, <laughs> um, I like that we're able to pivot quickly to new things, try things, AB test startups are a little bit more, um, nimble in that way and allow us to do that. Um, whereas bigger companies that have been around for longer. Um, they have bigger teams that we have to deal with, lots of different personalities. Sometimes there's red tape, big, long approval processes. Um, so that's why. I, I used to have my own startup and I found that it was still very difficult to get things done, mm. especially because sometimes there weren't enough people to get everything done. And so I would try to step in to do something but then my COO would be like, no, you can't do that. That's not your job. Mm -hmm. Like I'll, I'll do it or I'll figure out the right person to do it. But like, just no, just don't do it. And we would get into arguments because he was right, but I wanted to move. Yeah. And so he yeah. would, he would block me from doing what I thought was the right thing. But I knew that in the long term, he was helping me to do what I was supposed to be doing. Um, yeah. So I'm sure you come across these kinds of instances where uh, maybe not the right person is the one doing what needs to be done or. Exactly. Do you, exactly. do you have yeah. a specific example of that you could share? Yeah. Without naming names. I think so a lot. Yeah. A lot of our clients will have one or two marketers on their in-house team, whether they're junior marketers that we support, or maybe they have like one marketing leader and that person has one junior person. Um, so we're seeing that happen a lot where there's a marketing generalist on the in-house team and they sort of maybe have an inflated view of what their, where their skills actually lie. Um, and that, that's great. They want to be helpful in all these different areas, but you can't be proficient in paid search and also be a copywriter and be a graphic designer and be posting organically on LinkedIn every day and be doing events and be doing ABM it's just not one person's job. So in that way, it's just setting this person up for failure by saying, Hey, you're a team of one. Here's the whole marketing program, get it all done. And then let us know how it went. That's not fair. Um, so that's where we come in, in a lot of cases. I feel like if I look at LinkedIn or Twitter, I'll see a million people that, that say that they're, they can do all those skills. I know. It's like, well, which one There's can no you one. actually do? It's, right. Can you even do one of these? Yeah, I mean, 
a, a lot of startups say, oh, we want generalists to help us to start and then specialize over time. And I feel like my specialty is being a generalist, but I struggle to promote myself as an advisor and a consultant because a lot of the problems people need to solve are specialty problems. However, my specialty is in helping them uncover those problems from a holistic, high-level point of view as a generalist. So, I don't know. It's food for thought. Yeah. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. I mean, we've been working with a lot of fractional CMOs lately, which is an interesting relationship because that's their job is to kind of strategically guide the effort, let the client know where they should be allocating their budget, be that strategic lead. And then our team can kind of be that person's team to get it done. And that works well. So transparency is something that is extremely important. And I feel like transparency is not really the norm in early stage startups because the goal is to pretend publicly that everything's fine so that you can make your investors happy, you can get more clients, but privately, typically things are a shit show. So how do you get your clients to be transparent with you, basically treat you as if you're actually part of the team rather than just an outsourced provider, wherein they're telling you the truth, not what they want the, the world to see so that you can show the yeah. world what they want to see while you know what's really happening. Totally. Yes. So we've been really lucky with our clients. I think it's because we are so transparent. They mirror that with us. Um, we're super responsive. We have Slack channels with every client. We hop on Zooms all the time. Like we're right there with them and we really make it feel like we truly are an extension of their team. We're not an outsourced vendor that it takes a little bit of time to get to and then explain what your needs are and you have to meet about it. Then you have to meet again about it. You have to put the strategy together. We're right there with you. We're able to kind of pivot do, get something done, grab a design file for you. Like we're right there. And I think that helps garner that trust where a client really feels like we're on their team and they can be true and honest with us about where they're at, what their needs are. Numbers are down. Things aren't looking the way we want them to. How can we turn this around by the end of the quarter? Things like that they come to us with and that's okay. We're right there to kind of be like really solution oriented um, and be like, we are on your team. Let's, let's do this. We're seeing the same numbers you're seeing. We're checking your dashboards and you're reporting every day, just like you are. So it feels like a shared effort. How do you look at those numbers and, and turn them around? Because, okay, I guess this is a, this is a longer winded question. It's very easy for someone who's not well-trained in marketing to look at the vanity metrics and go, oh, those things are great, and then ignore the actual important things. So in terms of transparency, how do you get them to acknowledge that the vanity metrics are what they are, but they're not important and you should be looking at something else? Yeah, that's a great question. So that happens quite often with our clients, like even just the other day, we had a client that was like, hey, one of our big KPIs for the quarter is to make sure that we have eight blog posts go live a month. And the first question is, why? why? Well, can you give me an answer as to why that is? Why is that a KPI? When they can't answer that question, it opens up a dialogue. Okay. I think from my lens having done this for hundreds of startups, I think what you're trying to get at is you want a blog to be happening. You're not sure why. Let me tell you kind of what the purpose of a blog is today. And then let's back into frequency from there. We don't need to do eight a month and not have any clue as to the purpose behind that. That's a lot of work for very little payout. So in that way, it's like asking the right probing questions, helping the client understand what their KPIs should be from a marketing lens today in 2024, and then backing into like what those numbers should be and helping them and really kind of letting them know that we have some skin in this game too. Um, and we're all in it together. That helps with that transparent sort of conversation. How do you, how do you explain what a blog is without pissing your client off? 
Yeah. I mean, we had a client once come to us and they were like, all of our blog posts in the last year have just been AI. I'm like, you can tell. Like your blog, I don't understand what the purpose of this is. If that's all you're doing, it's just copying and pasting out of chat GPT. Like, what are you measuring? What is the goal of this effort? So it's a lot of reminding them that a blog has an SEO piece to it. And a lot of times that's the main primary goal of a blog is just to make sure that we're serving Google as it relates to SEO, mm. organic SEO rankings. That's real. It's not, we're not writing blog articles for you and making sure that you like it. I'm not really concerned whether you like it or not. It's being written for a purpose that will put your business where it needs to be online. Your preferences, the person I'm speaking to at the client company doesn't it, matter. Are yeah, exactly. So recently I embarked on a multi-week project to get the podcast up to uh, snuff, whatever you want to call it, to make it more professional. One of those points was I had redesigned the website. The redesign was finished months ago. It had a new template for the blog posts. So I knew that I'd have to go back and redo the the template for every single blog. And I'd been doing this for years. So there was like 200 blogs to re to review the template for. But on top of that, the last episode I had created a blog post for was 115. But when I started the project, I was at 194. So about, you know, 80 something blog posts that I needed to create from scratch for the podcast for the website. So that if anyone tried to come to the website, they would see that I'm not lazy and you know the website actually is up you know up to date and what i thought would be interesting was adding transcripts for them because one interview could have 10 15 20 thousand words and i thought google might really like that maybe it does maybe it doesn't i don't know but i am in the middle of doing the transcripts now because i've done everything else and it's it's an absolute headache um, luckily, I used a program that used an AI to translate and uh, to transcribe, and it's an amazing tool. But it doesn't have the guests' names, and it doesn't have them formatted. It has um, uh, conjugate, not conjugation, it has punctuation, but it doesn't have paragraph formatting. It's not nice. So, like, I still have to pay someone to go and review it all because if if I do it, I, I've, I've got 167 transcripts to go through. So, I am. I'm d deeply uh, focused on SEO while painfully hating every second of it. So I completely understand the the point of trying to figure out what the hell is the point of SEO and, and what you're doing with it and why you have it. Yeah. Um, I'm literally just doing it for Google to be like, hey, there's words about entrepreneurship here. We should probably show entrepreneurs this page, basically something like that. Yeah, so it's, literally. It's, it's been hell. It's, it's a job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a full-time job. Yeah. So what are some things you're thinking about when trying to determine if someone is a good client? Yeah. Vetting clients. That's, that's a great one. Um, I'm always looking for startups that have a really clear grasp on what they do. So whether you're SaaS or you're like a professional services company that's sort of in tech, it depends on kind of who you are and what you're doing, hmm. but you have to have a clear grasp on that part. You don't necessarily need to know about kind of how to do the messaging or how to kind of determine your buyer personas that, that we can come in and help with that stuff. Um, but we've had clients before that are like, we've changed the way we talk about our product 10 times in the last two years and we still want to keep changing it. We have butting heads internally as to like the CTO wants it to be this, the CEO wants it to be this. So we're doing both and we're testing. It's like, no, you cannot test on what your product does. Does it do it or not? Like mm. that part you have to have a really clear grasp on. Um, and then we can come in and sort of position that in the way that it needs to be positioned to the right folks online. Um, so that's always really important. That's a really complicated thing that I learned because when, 
this is, it makes me cringe to think about it. PTSD basically. So basically <laughs> we were building a, a tech company. We we're building a product. We were developing features and for the longest time I was responsible for coming up with the feature specifications because it was my vision. And the problem was I didn't know how to decide what were the right features to develop at the right time because we were pre-launch. So we didn't have user feedback. And while I was doing this, we then had the, the COO and the marketing director trying to figure out when are things going to come out so we can start to develop the wording around it so that we could start the messaging and the blogs and the engagement to get people interested about, hey, this product's coming out. These are the features for it. And so the the marketing is not something that you like. You can't publish something. You, you can't publish code today and start promoting it today. You have to like prepare what you're going to develop for the next like six months or a year and then start creating the messaging for it two, three, four months before it comes out so that people can be aware that this thing is coming. And I've even thought about this recently for the podcast. Someone was talking to me because I'm trying to figure out how to make it possible to grow much faster. And someone said, oh, you have all these shorts clips. Are you doing teasers for new episodes coming out? And I was like, no, I'm not but it's a good idea. And I've thought about this in the last few days. And like, what's wrong? Why aren't you able to do that? Because you have the, the full episode ready to go weeks in advance. Why aren't you getting the teasers ready? I said, well, the problem is my long form editor is selecting the shorts and then sending them to my short form editor and the short form editor is getting it to me. Well, they're doing it at such a pace where episode 196 came out and I was getting the shorts from episode 189. So I can't possibly promote a teaser when something is coming out six or seven weeks after the the full episode. So obviously there's a problem with the way my team is running, which is preventing me from doing a thing that could potentially create mystery and intention and want people to, to come. And so, um, yeah, marketing requires a tremendous amount of thought and planning. And as you said, if the team internally has no idea what the hell they're building or who they're building for or why they're building it, their marketing is going to just not be able to hit any points whatsoever for potential clients. Right. Exactly. So how do you go about finding clients or do you only do inbound or what's your process for that? Yeah. So we you know, everything that we do for our clients in terms of inbound marketing strategies, tactics, campaigns, we do for ourselves. Um, so we kind of treat Move marketing as another client, um, which is great. We tap into our collective networks. My network has been amazing. We always will either get introductions or full like referrals from current clients, other people, the startup community, it's like everybody bounces around from different startups. So it's yeah. like this person was at this client company. They jumped to a new client company. We kept the old one and now we're in the new one too. Like that, a lot of mm. that goes on. Um, so it's been good. I mean, it's a lot of referral word of mouth. That's great. We should talk more after this about that. Okay. I might have some services uh, <laughs> that are complimentary okay. for these clients. So people think about PR as an extension of marketing. Do you provide any PR? And if not, why not? And what is the separation there? And, and what should teams, companies know about that difference? Yeah. Yeah. We don't do PR yet. We could expand into PR. We've explored that option before. However, it we've had great success partnering with PR firms and sort of tag teaming a client together where it's like, there's a PR firm, there's us. And together we sort of make up all of what that client wants to be allocating their budget towards PR done. Right. Is a lot of work. I mean, you have to scan every news outlet, like find out where your client company was mentioned within articles is it a good mention? Is it an okay mention? Is it something we want to share? Pitching all of the C-suite members and their talking points and things that they might want to be doing, getting them booked on podcasts, getting them booked to do different interviews, and then following up to get the date for when that interview is going to go live. And then it's a lot. Um, and our role kind of in the past with PR has been like, 
hey, they want to do a press release. Let's help them write it. Like, let's help them produce the press release. If it's something about a new product enhancement or a new C-suite member joins the team, that kind of stuff, like company news. Um, but all of the other sort of principles that make up PR, it's really best left to a PR firm that does just that in our experience. You just gave me a SaaS idea. Oh. Um, I, I don't know if anyone's done this yet, but basically like set, uh, sentiment analysis based on a keyword to go, oh, you know, if the, if the name is your company and it'll tell you, oh, you appeared here, here, here. So there's a company called Ground News. I don't know if you've heard of them. Yeah. So Ground News does sentiment analysis uh, as well as political leaning left, right, and center for different news outlets and specific articles. It wouldn't be a far cry to do something like that, but you know, instead of uh, left, right, center politics based on uh, sentiment analysis of who's writing it and uh, why they're writing it, and you know, therefore being able to do your own yeah. research and not have to pay a PR firm. Although, don't tell the PR firms right. I said that. Actually, no, it would be really it'd be uh, PR firms would be clients basically. I, I I could see that. Totally. Yeah. I mean, speaking of data, like we've been using a lot of like first party data with our clients, like doing our own surveys to their own audiences, like doing polls on LinkedIn. Like there's a lot of different ways to collect data from your own customer base or your own audience on LinkedIn through email campaigns. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways to do that. Um, so you don't need to rely on third party data or rely on some team to do that. Have you heard of Playbook UX? No, it's a, I interviewed the founder like two or three years ago and what they do is allow companies to do like uh, user testing with live product so that they can get a sense okay. of what the customer actually thinks as they're using it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how deep you go into that, but that could be interesting. Even if you don't use it, it could be interesting for your clients to use. Yeah. I should get them to sponsor this episode. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had to fire a client and if so what was the decision making behind deciding to let them go yes we have um i have done that a few times um a lot of times it's based on a lack of understanding around our working dynamic um it's being disrespectful of our team's time. It's pinging us on Saturdays and Sundays. It's pinging us at midnight. Everything being a fire um, that needs to be put out immediately. Everything's high priority. That dynamic doesn't work for us. Um, we don't need to put up with that. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't. So if after however many attempts to kind of speak to a client about the dynamic and how we need to be working together. What can we do better to make sure that you're understanding how much lead time we need for something, what the delivery process looks like on our end, how our team operates, what more can we provide in terms of transparency and visibility to get you to a place of understanding. And we do that and we do it again and again and again, and nothing's changing we have to move on because at that point, the efficiency gains that we're so desperately trying to infuse into the relationship, if that, if that doesn't get us anywhere, then we can't continue on with that client. And we've definitely had that happen a few times. This is kind of a side question. Thinking about marketing, as I mentioned, I've been thinking about marketing for my podcast and I feel like my audience are your clients. But I don't know how to reach them and get them to be like subscribers, people that binge the content. Because I feel like I'm speaking to them from my own experience and that they really badly need to listen to what myself and the guests that I have are saying. From a marketer's, uh, from marketer's point of view, how do you think I could best find those people to become the audience and get them to become like fans? Yeah, that's definitely tough. It's getting tougher as we sort of move year to year, especially as like new platforms keep popping up online, like where people are living, like people spend their time online so differently and that keeps evolving. Um, 
we have clients even that have TikToks now. Like it's a constant sort of ever changing world on the internet where people like to spend their time, what they like to listen to, what they like to watch. So it's, it's definitely like an ongoing investigation into, okay, it feels like some of our listeners are a part of these LinkedIn groups. It feels like some of our listeners based on X, Y, Z, maybe it's a survey, maybe it's a poll, you know, ask them for that feedback and they'll tell you like, kind of like, oh, this is where we spend our time. This is what we like, like ask them for that information. And that might help you uncover sort of where they are, what the right call to actions are, what the right carrots are to kind of offer to them to get that in exchange. So it's, it's like a, it's an ongoing effort for sure. I'm working with a community, it's a Discord server. They have about 6,000 paying customers and they're mostly agency owners and e-commerce brand owners. And they also have like a 10,000 person subscriber. It's like a lead lead newsletter. So they haven't converted into paying okay. members yet. And so I was like thinking, how can I get the podcast in front of their people? Because I also do webinars with them like once every few weeks. And so for me, it's like, oh, well, if they can see my podcast and then they see I'm doing events, maybe they'll want to join the events more and maybe they'll become subscribers and maybe they'll, uh, you know, for, for the community, maybe they'll convert from this, you know, lead list to a, a member so that they could access me more inside of the mm -hmm. server because I'm, I'm there and active. Uh, and so I was talking with him, you know, the, the guy that runs it about, you know, who are they, what do they like and all that. And we, we discovered pretty quickly that I have an episode that would be very interesting to them because I interviewed a person who runs a $30 million per year supplement brand in the U S and he makes his money hundred percent from affiliates. So he doesn't put any money into ads. He doesn't have organic uh, UGC, social, anything. He just has people that are running affiliate ads on his behalf. And he's like, that's amazing. They would love that. They've probably never even thought of running affiliate programs. Yeah. So uh, like you said, doing surveys and all that, I, I talked to the person that knows the people and so was able to pretty right. quickly uncover. So now I'm thinking, oh, okay, I can, I can write a little blurb, you know, for them to promote this specific episode to this specific list of people and, and see how it goes. Totally. That's awesome. How did you get your first client? Um, let's see. It was a lot of cold messaging, a lot of LinkedIn trolling. <laughs> um, our first client took a meeting with me from a cold message. He was, so I went to UConn. He, w he went to UConn. So I used that Mm. alumni yeah. <laughs> messaging. Um, it was a long shot, but he was like, Oh, a fellow Husky, I'll take a meeting. Um, so that was my first meeting. Um, I ended up booking him as a retainer client, which was shocking to me. I was like, wow, I can't believe I just did that. Um, but that was lots of LinkedIn, lots of cold, like I'm talking 50 cold messages a day, four months, um, just wow. to make sure people knew I existed. Um, lots of pinging my own network, an email newsletter. Hey, this is what's going on at Move. This is what Move is. Move is real. Like, just a lot of that until people started introing me to friends of theirs. People started to say, "Hey, my colleague is actually doing this thing on the side. Do you want to talk to him?" Yes. Like, and then it just started to kind of pick up from there. Were there ever any times that you wanted to quit? At, at any point, um, not at any point over these years, not, not just when you're starting. I think there's been a lot of times where I've wanted to like change my vision. And like, I think the biggest thing that sometimes I've like vacillated on is like, how big do we want to get? Like, how big do I want this to be versus how like small and kind of boutique vibes do I want it to stay? Um, and that, I vacillate a lot on. Um, so like my vision will change based on that. I've never actually wanted to quit. I've definitely been burned out, tired, <laughs> stressed. Like that is sort of always the current state. Um, but I've never wanted to quit. Just change, I think. 
Are there any specific moments you can remember uh, in your journey with the business that you felt that burnt out? Because I, I have I have ideas and I, yeah. I've kind of talked about them publicly about the points at which I think uh, founders get burned out when running agencies. So I'm curious to hear what your actual kind of experience is. Yeah, I think early on, I had a hard time with delegating, like seeing good opportunities to delegate things that would have historically been mine. Like, oh, I do that. And like just blindly without even thinking, just keep doing it instead of, oh, well, I have a team now. I'm hiring and growing and bringing new people in. So the team keeps getting bigger, yet I still keep doing these things that could easily be delegated to people on the team that are better suited to be doing them, that have the expertise to be doing them. I need to pause, take a step back before I just keep going and going and going and think about how to bring the team in, how to delegate things accordingly. So then my time can be freed up to do the high value activities like pitching, like selling, like looking at our model, understanding our revenue. What does the forecast look like? Those are the things that I should be spending my time on really working on the business, not working in the business. Um, and so that's been something I have to always kind of keep thinking about as we grow. Do you recall about what your monthly revenue was at that time? Because so basically the, the the thinking that I've had is founders start to burn out, agents, agency owners start to burn out around 20 to 25K a month because they haven't really hired anyone yet. They may have like a contractor, but mostly yeah. they're still doing everything themselves. And the demand is higher than their ability to serve. So they start to piss off their customers and they burn out and they get depressed and pissed off and stressed and, and want to give up or, uh, or they don't. Um, and then they typically, I think they find someone and then maybe like they get to maybe 28, 29, 30, 32, 35, and then they start to maybe have another problem and then realize that maybe they need to hire another person. So yeah, I'm curious uh, about what time your revenue yeah. was that you you felt that like that burnout and that need to hire the first person. Yeah. So I hired my first person when we were at right at about 30,000 a month. Um, and then I hired the second person when we got to about 40 so on and so forth. But I think for me, the biggest like moments of burnout that I have felt is like now we have a team of eight and I think the burnout chapter has been like more prevalent now that we have such a larger team because I feel like I'm trying to manage everybody, coach everybody, be that mentor for everybody guide them in terms of our values, our mission, what we're here to accomplish, make sure that client delivery is where we need it to be, standards are met, client satisfaction's high. That, all of that sort of being like the GM is a lot while I'm also trying to work on the business, pitch, sell, go to events, make sure that we have the right collateral that describes what we do, like making sure that I'm on top of trends and patterns in our space, what what's going on? How does AI impact us? How do we use AI? Like those are the things. So for me, it's like the larger the team, almost the more they need from me and being there enough for them as it relates to coaching and sort of making sure everybody's on the same page while also trying to do CEO level things at, at the same time is where sometimes I feel like I'm coming up short in some of these areas because I'm spread too thin. So it sounds like you need to hire an operations manager. Yes. That's our next hire. <laughs> <laughs> so you're already is... looking for someone. Yeah. We actually have somebody that we are looking to bring on this summer that we've been in talks with. It's such a big role. It's I've tried sure. to hire into this role before it has not worked out um, because I think I still have such a tight grasp on like how I want things done, our brand, the way we do things, the way we talk about things, the way we okay. pitch ourselves, like that yeah. all needs to be like very much aligned to my vision. And if this person isn't right there with me on the same page, it, it doesn't work. So we have somebody that I'm putting through the paces right now <laughs> before we bring her in. As important it is for your vision to be the thing that shines through, 
that person also is going to have their own ideas. And I feel like for them to feel successful in the role and to want to stay with you long term, you're going to have to give up a little bit of control for them to have their own ability to express themselves and kind of add to the vision. How do you feel totally. about that? Yep. Yeah, for sure. So we have so many different, so like I said, we have a team of eight. Every person on the team brings such a like colorful background and expertise in what they're bringing to the team and like delegating, collaborating, having that open dialogue with each person on the team. It does help me to remember that it's like you guys also have really awesome experiences um scenarios that you've been in that are similar to the scenario that the client's in like step forward and i want to hear what you have to say i want to hear your input i want to collaborate with with you guys um and that makes us all better including me so i'm not so much sort of married to my own forward vision to the point where I'm not able to hear others, especially those on my team that are like, Hey, we should be doing this. Have you thought of this? It's like, yes, that's a great idea. Let's, let's flesh that out and see how we might be able to add that into our service mix. Those kinds of ideas I'm always open to. And I think this person in particular, this ops manager sort of director person um, I'm definitely going to want to make sure that they feel like they have a voice. They can be vocal with me. They can bring their own experience and expertise to the table. So I can kind of see my way out of client delivery and client satisfaction and sort of working in the business. So it's, it's going to be a little bit of a dynamic that we'll have to kind of figure out. Hmm. So it seems like the idea of a boutique, kind of agency is losing out against your your desire for maybe a slightly larger business would you agree with that since you're will, willing to hire an ops so. manager I think so yeah so what's your ideal size of a company and it doesn't have to be a headcount I mean I, I don't know how you look at it either it's a headcount or it's a revenue um, cause this is something I think about all the time. I think, and I've had a lot of conversations with people who are running companies and they've never really thought through like why they're doing what they're doing and what they want. Yeah. And yeah. so like you, I've interviewed people and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing 30 K a month with my, you know, SMMA, my social media marketing agency and I'm like 19, but like, I'm lost. I don't know what I'm doing. I was like, well, why are you doing it? And they're like, because I want to escape the matrix basically. Right. They, they hear this term from like yeah. Andrew Tate and they're like, yeah, I want to escape the matrix. And they like get to that point where they quote unquote can escape the matrix. They don't need to go to college. They don't need a job. As long as they keep their head on straight and they don't blow the money they're making, they'll be able to make enough sustainably for a long time. But they don't know what they're doing. They don't know why they're doing it. They don't have a plan for the business and therefore they don't know where it can possibly go. Uh, Right. So, so I always tell them, Hey, like, do you have a number that's going to make you happy? You know, or do you, do you need 10,000 a month to be happy? Do you need a hundred thousand a month personally take home after tax to be happy? Like, what are you doing it for? Right. One, one guy I spoke to is like, well, I've got three kids. One of them's like a newborn and I want to work less so that I can spend more time with my kids. And I was like, great. How much do you need to do that? What's that number that you need to take home? in order to be able to feel like you can take time to spend with your family. And he's like, oh, about 30. I'm like, great. So you need about 120,000 a month, 150,000 a month to be able to take 30 K home. And so you're five times smaller than you should be. And he's like, but I'm taking 30 K now I go, but you don't have time for your family. You just told me you want to spend time with your you with your family, but you also feel like you're not able to spend time with your family because you're burnt out, busy working on your business. Mm -hmm. So for you to take thirty home and have time for your family, you need a team, and in order to have a team, you need to do over a million dollars a year in revenue. Congratulations, you have a goal. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you know, I never really thought about that. So I'm, I guess long winded again. Have you thought through that? And kind of, if so, do you have a, a concrete goal? I don't have a concrete goal. So I think for us, it's, I don't have like a headcount goal. 
I don't necessarily have like, oh, when we get to this revenue mark, I'll be happy or I'll have these five things when we hit this revenue mark. So then I'm going to stop. Like it, we, I don't have that. Um, what I have is how can we serve as many good fit startup clients with the right sized team of experts? How big can that get? How, how efficient can we be in our tech enablement, people business? How can we keep doing that? How big can it get? That's sort of like the question that I'm seeking the answer to. Like we hit a million, we're on track to do 2 million. It's like, all right, well, I don't want to, that, I don't have a goal that's sort of like, oh, well, once we hit three, then I'm good. Then let's just maintain. It's like, I, you can't I want to see where the limit is. <laughs> like maintain, we've tried that. Honestly, when we hit a million, it was like, let's just do a million for the next five years. So let's just maintain this size and, and this sort of you can't. client team mix. I don't, I, my soul like does not operate <laughs> well when I'm in maintenance mode. I have to be in growth mode. I have to be thinking about what's next. I have to have that sort of North star. Other like maintaining what we have is just not who I am. Um, so it's always kind of like, all right, well, the unknown is exciting. How big could this get? What does big mean? Is it a revenue number? Is it a team size? Is it number of clients? What does that look like? I don't know yet, but I think we have the model. It's just scaling it. There was a movie that came out a long time ago called Shawshank Redemption. Not sure if you saw it. Yeah. There's a line in the movie that says, you, you either get busy living or you get busy dying. And basically in terms of a company, you're either growing or you're dying. There is no such thing as maintenance. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Because your revenue is either going up or it's going down. Because if it's staying the same, you're dying. <laughs> right. Totally. <laughs> because there has to be some reason why it's not growing. And exactly. yeah. typically the reason why it's not growing is because of the founder. Mm-hmm. Which is why you need that general yeah. manager. <laughs> yeah. For so sure. it's I, time. <laughs> I have a really close friend and his brother started a, a B2B SaaS about 12 or 13 years ago. And they've been grinding their asses off this entire time. Bootstrap. Uh, they never raised money. Yep. And it was only after like nine or 10 years that they started to like grow like really, really grow. Mm. I mean, they, they had been doing over a million dollars a year in revenue for a while, but it wasn't until yeah. like this past year that they're going to surpass five or six. And they have like 30 employees, but they, they realize that there's a lot of problems in the business. And I pointed out to them because they tell me the problems that they have because I've known it for like 25 years. And they tell me the problems. And I, I, every time my answer is like, yeah, the problem is you. I go, you're doing your sales. Because <laughs> they had an issue with like their salesperson. So they got rid of the sales, the head of sales. And they took on mm. responsibility of sales. And I said, you got to get out of sales. Nobody can do it better than me. Yeah, but you're the CEO. You shouldn't be doing sales. Like if you're doing sales, you're at conferences, you're going to hotels, you're talking to... So they do like a hotel yeah. um, back end and front end. So they they have specific people to talk to. So I'm like, yeah, you know, you have a marketing issue, you have a pro product issue. Those people weren't great at their jobs. You let them go. You took on the responsibility. You're stopping your business. You've got to get out of it in order for yeah. you to be able to do your job. So that Because they have like 30 employees now. So it's really important for them to have specific department heads to focus on those things. So yeah. it's, a, it's a lot more than just a, a general management at that point. But um, yeah, at this point, they've just acquired a company. Uh, because some of those clients were also clients of theirs, and some of their clients were were client were you know could use that software. So it's like a synergistic. You know, we can make more money by having our clients use the other soft uh, system, and those people could use this. Because I guess it was like a web design agency. So okay, yeah. So it's like oh, we can design. You know, not only can we provide the software for you, but we can also design your websites 
and we can hook in our software to your website so we can make your own because your website right. sucks. So yeah. we'll do it for you and we'll make it a lot better and we'll optimize it so you can yeah. convert, you know, people coming in to sell and we'll just make more money from all of it. Um, this is a very wise, very interesting uh, thing. And they told me the whole process of like the acquisition. It was really fascinating to hear the, the, mm -hmm. the psychology behind it. I may end up bringing them on uh, to interview them at some point to talk about these things. Uh, they were actually the first people I went to when I wanted to start the podcast because they were the only people that I knew that were doing like really well in business at the yeah. moment. And I was like, yeah, I want to interview. And they're like, eh, we're not ready to talk about the kind of stuff. But like, yeah, I think it's time. That's awesome. Yeah. So just have to convince them. So, <laughs> so is there anything that I haven't really asked you that you feel would be interesting to talk about or share? based on your experience? Um, no, I mean, being an entrepreneur is hard. It's rewarding, but it's hard. Um, I think if you have an idea and you want to do it, go for it. You can always go backwards, but you can't always go forwards. Um, so I think that's it. Can you though? I, f I feel like I had this conversation with my marketing director, my COO years ago, and they said, a startup is this kind of thing, especially in the marketing area, that once you start, you can't really stop. It's like a moving train. The minute you start your marketing activity, you can't really stop unless the money literally runs out. Otherwise, you will yeah. screw your business. Yeah. And I even, I even have a good friend who runs a startup, and... He had been running the startup for several years and he was wondering why the company wasn't really growing. Now, what they're doing is very niche. So obviously it's difficult to grow in that space. But he, he thought that what they were doing was working until he had someone come in who was like a marketing expert or whatever and helped him realize that like they weren't doing any marketing. He's like, oh, you need to market mm -hmm. if you want to get more customers. He literally like nobody had taught him this and he had gone to an accelerator with like a microsoft sponsored accelerator and in, in france and nobody taught him like how to do marketing for his company because he's a tech guy so he doesn't understand marketing so he's like oh i'm gonna build this product and people are gonna come so now they're growing because they're doing marketing but they struggled for a long time because they weren't yep so it's definitely a momentum yeah What is something really important that you've learned from this entire process and kind of how have you changed as a result? Yeah, I think I'm definitely more confident in my own decision making. I feel like staying true to myself, staying true to my vision, it takes a lot of like self-confidence to do that, especially when you have clients and employees and people around you, partners and friends that want to give you advice. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people have opinions about what you're doing um, and you have to really stick to your guns and stay true to what you're setting out to do. And I've kind of learned that I have the confidence to do that. And I'm, I feel really rooted in that now after five years of doing it. I think I have a really good handle on that and sort of what I'm interested in, what I'm not interested in, the ability to say no, um, while also understanding opportunities to say yes, even if it's something you've never done before. I feel really rooted in like kind of who I am and what the decisions are that I'm making. Um, whereas in the beginning, I did not feel that. So I feel like that evolution has been really, really nice. How would you like to see the company change and how would you like to see yourself change in the next few years from a result of that growth? I would like to keep growing, as we've mentioned. Um, I'd like to see our team continue to grow. I'd like to personally sort of step back from being in client services and sort of being that account manager face for our clients and bring people that are far more 
better suited for mm -hmm. that, far more experienced in that to do that work. Um, so I can take a step back and really continue to work on the path forward for Move marketing and, and what I want in terms of its future. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Caitlin. Of course. Thank you. Thanks for sticking with us to the end of this episode. We know that you're going to like the one that we have next week. And don't forget to click here to watch the next video we know you're going to love.